welcome to this special bonus episode of Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the history of the White Star Line, the company who owned the infamous Titanic. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, wartime violence, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. Today, there will be some terms in the French and German languages in which I am not fluent, but I will do my best to give accurate pronunciations. Please also note that this historical recollection is not going to be a play-by-play. -play. For brevity's sake, some details may be left out. The White Star Line lasted 102 years, so there's a lot to cover here. So make sure you have a beverage and a snack, shipwreckers. Alright, let's just get into it. White Star Line was founded in Liverpool, England by Henry Wilson and John Pilkington in 1845. Originally, it was focused on the UK to Australia route, and this increased dramatically when gold was discovered in Australia in 1851. After gold was found in Australia, people were more inclined to immigrate, and the population of Australia ballooned from 430,000 to 1.7 million in just three short years. Being so many people were going to and from Australia, Pilkington and Wilson decided to emphasize the safety of their ships when addressing the press, giving White Star Line a better reputation. At the time, these ships were wooden boats typically driven by sails. They were not yet the iron steamships we know White Star Line to have. To make crossing the ocean in a wooden sailboat, surrounded by people getting seasickness with poor ventilation and no electric lighting or indoor plumbing more comfortable, White Star Line began employing groups of musicians to play popular tunes for passengers to dance to and be entertained by. Size and speed of ships started to become more important as the amount of immigrants grew, with regular crossings needing to be scheduled and ran efficiently. Originally, the fleet was made up of chartered sailing vessels, the first being RMS Taylor, Blue Jacket, Red Jacket, White Star, Mermaid, Iowa, Ellen, Emma, and Ben Nevis. Taylor was the largest ship of her day, and the company placed so much hope onto her. Unfortunately, they put all their eggs into the wrong basket, for Taylor proved very difficult to control when she left for her maiden voyage on January 19, 1854, and with an inexperienced crew, it made it more difficult. RMS Taylor would strike rocks in very rough seas at Lambay Island off Ireland, and the ship went down, taking 360 of the 650 on board with her. After the 290 survivors reached land once more, an inquiry into the sinking was done and cast the blame on the ship's owners, Charles Moore and Company, since they didn't take any of the necessary safety precautions after putting the ship into service. Thankfully, this took all of the blame off of White Star Line and Taylor's captain. In the shipping company's infancy like this, one devastating sinking could have ended everything. They'd end up building ships to replace her, and starting voyages between Victoria, British Columbia, and Liverpool, promoted in Welsh newspapers as the gateway to the Klondike Gold Rush. The tides would turn in 1856, with White Star Line losing postal contracts while Wilson was still pushing for larger ships in order to keep the public's eyes on White Star Line. Pilkington, none the wiser, left the company, and Wilson would replace him with his brother-in-law, a man by the name of James Chambers. Long story short, White Star Line merged with two other steamship companies to form Oriental Steam Navigation Company Limited in 1864, but the business continued to decline due to heavy investments on ships and borrowing too much cash, to the point where the Royal Bank of Liverpool denied them in October of 1867. The debt in White Star Line's ledger had reached 527,000 pounds, which is roughly 69.7 million pounds in 2022 with inflation. The debt would force White Star Line into bankruptcy, which was a blessing in disguise. White Star Line's savior and the man who would make it the company we know today entered the scene on January 18, 1868. 
He was Mr. Thomas Ismay, a director for the National Line, and he purchased the trade name and goodwill of the bankrupt White Star Line, as well as the house flag, spending roughly a thousand pounds on it. That means if he bought it today, in 2022, Mr. Ismay would have spent around 133,643 pounds. He purchased the company intending to operate large steamships and ocean liners on the North Atlantic service between Liverpool and New York City, beginning by establishing a new headquarters at Albion House in Liverpool. It still exists today if you wanted to see it. During a game of billiards, Ismay was approached by Gustav Christian Schwab and his nephew, the shipbuilder Gustav Wilhelm Wolff. Being a successful merchant and wanting to support his nephew's business, Schwab offered to finance the new line, but only if Ismay agreed that all of his ships would be built by Harland and Wolf. Ismay gladly agreed, and thus began a beautiful partnership that would spawn many beautiful ships. Harland and Wolf also agreed they would only build ships for White Star Line and its subsidiaries, steering clear of any rival companies, building the ships at cost plus a fixed percentage. They received their first orders for ships on July 30th, 1869, with William Imrie joining the managing company in 1870. The company would be managed by a new firm, Ismay Imrie and & Company, and as the first ship was commissioned, the White Star Line was formed. Ismay formed it with a capital of £400,000, splitting it into shares of £1,000. The organization proved to be complex, but it was publicly known as the White Star Line, and word began spreading about this new White Star Line, with people speculating where on the ocean the new ships would emerge. There were already four competing companies on the Atlantic, the rather modest national line that Ismay once had shares in, the Guian Line, the Inman Line, and of course, the Cunard Line. Based upon the characteristics of those first ships ordered, Thomas Ismay had his eye on the Northern Atlantic from the get-go. These first ships that would emerge were of the Oceanic class. These were six nearly identical ocean liners, starting with the first four, the Oceanic, Atlantic, Baltic, and Republic, with the Celtic and Adriatic following a year later, and being slightly larger than the first four. If you're interested in hearing more about the Oceanic class, we have a video on the SS Atlantic. Check the cards of this video to find the link to it. These ships were the first to start with the iconic IC suffix that White Star Line ships were known to have, just like how Cunards ended primarily with the IA suffix for the longest time. The ships were pretty revolutionary, running mostly on steam and having rigged sails just in case coal reserves ran out, and to comfort nervous passengers. They also had two classes, which was common for the time, the saloon class and steerage class, equivalent to first and third class. It was spacious and comfortable for immigrants, which made the ships popular. The company was branching out at this time into other areas as well, taking the route to India through the Suez Canal with the Asiatic and Tropic. This route was not profitable, and so the ships were moved to the route to South America to compete with the Pacific Steam Navigation Company. This wouldn't last long, with the liners being withdrawn for service elsewhere, and the older sailing vessels being the ships to take over this route under a subsidiary, the Northwestern Navigation Company. However, the sinking of SS Atlantic would be a damper on the success and positivity the company was garnering, bringing in unwanted negative attention and questions. The Atlantic sank in 1873 and was a devastating loss, killing 585 of the 952 that were on board, including every woman and all but one child. White Star Line would be accused of recklessness and mismanagement, especially due to navigational errors found by Canadian inquiry. Though White Star Line wanted to forget the Atlantic and quickly pulled her from advertisements, the public did not forget, and in order to financially preserve the company, the Tropic and Asiatic were sold. Despite the setback of SS Atlantic sinking, White Star Line remained undeterred and continued to expand their operation across the North Atlantic. But their competitors weren't out of the race. Cunard, the Guian Line, and the Inman Line continued to put out their own successful ships in response to groundbreaking liners released by White Star Line. It would continue to be tit for tat, seeing who could make the biggest, fastest, and most luxurious ocean liners on the seas. In 1877, White Star Line began sharing a postal agreement with the Cunard Line, and this allowed White Star Line's ships to be prefixed with RMS, which means Royal Mail Ship. 
Royal Mail ships, abbreviated to RMS, are ships used for carrying mail under contract to the British Royal Mail, and this designation dates back all the way to 1840. In recent years, only three ships with the prefix RMS remain standing. RMS Seguin, which is the oldest steam-powered vessel still in use in Canada, RMV Scillian III, owned and operated by Isles of Sicily Steamship Company, and RMS Queen Mary II of the Cunard Line. After the arrival of the first RMS Britannic and RMS Germanic, there was a surplus of ships on the North Atlantic route. Luckily at this time, the president of the Occidental and Oriental Steamship Company, formed in 1874, George Bradbury, enlisted the help of Thomas Ismay in setting up his new service to compete with the Pacific Mail Steamship Company. Ismay lent Oceanic to the new company, since she was an older vessel and unneeded on the Atlantic, as well as two more modest steamships, the Belgic and the Gaelic. This charter was profitable for White Star Line and got their ships' names out there, and Oceanic remained on the San Francisco to Hong Kong route for 20 years. This partnership on the Pacific Ocean would last until 1906, ending with White Star Line withdrawing the Coptic, and two years later, the Occidental and Oriental Steamship Company would disappear due to competition from new ships of the Pacific Mail Company. In 1882, another opportunity would fall into Thomas Ismay's lap. The Shaw, Saville, and Albion line was founded, opening a route to New Zealand, but they were also inexperienced. Therefore, Ismay and White Star Line proposed a joint service, starting in 1884 with Coptic, Ionic, and Doric, as well as the Shaw, Saville, and Albion liners, Arua, and Tanui. From 1902, the service saw its ships renewed with the arrival of the new Corinthic, Athenic, and the second Ionic, all of which were operated into the 1930s. This relationship between the White Star Line and the Shaw Seville Albion Line continued even after White Star Line ceased to exist, and the latter continued to use White Star Line's nomenclature, giving their ships names ending in IC. Innovation wasn't just limited to expansion around the world, however. Innovations in ship design and technology would be continuous throughout the White Star Line's life cycle, starting with acquiring different types of cargo ships that could transport live cattle, among other things. The first of these was the Kufic and the Runic, which was followed by the Bovic and Neuronic in the 1890s. The Neuronic infamously disappeared, and we have an episode covering her if you're interested. Just check the cards for the link to it. Two other cattle carriers, Sevic and Georgic, were constructed in 1894 and 1895 respectively, and soon after the company abandoned the transportation of live cattle. For the next 12 years after this, White Star Line sets its sights on expanding their cargo services and establishing both a lucrative passenger service and cargo trade to New Zealand. Unfortunately, by 1887, the six ocean liners that were running for the White Star Line were now outdated, being outpaced and outshined by newer liners built by competitors. They planned two new liners, Majestic and Teutonic, to outdo the competition, and set up an arrangement with the British government to receive a subsidy from them in exchange for making the ships not only into passenger liners, but easily convertible into armed merchant cruisers. They were also the first liners to be equipped with twin screws and triple expansion steam engines. They were also the first of the White Star Line's ships to move to the three-class system, creating a middle class between the lucrative and expensive first class and the economical immigrant-friendly third class. Teutonic's first keel plates were laid in March of 1887, and Majestic followed six months later. They were the last speed record breakers for White Star Line, and it would be the last time that White Star Line would focus on speed rather than comfort. Both ships would capture the blue ribbon at different times. Since they had Teutonic and Majestic, some of the aging ships in the fleet were retired and scrapped to make room for the two new beauties. By 1893, the Teutonic sisters had established themselves on the Atlantic, and both were impressive. Teutonic was not only the first White Star Line ship to be built without square-rigged sails, but she was also featured in the 1899 Spithead Naval Review in conjunction with the state visit of Kaiser Wilhelm II. He was so impressed with Teutonic that he wanted superliners like that in his own country and thus donned a new era of ocean liner in Germany. After an explosion of rapid growth and expanding its services in the late 1890s, the White Star Line began to shift its focus from trying to have the fastest liners on the water 
especially since Cunard always seemed to one-up this conquest, to having the most comfortable and luxurious with the finest amenities. The first step into this decadent world of luxury was with S.S. Simric in 1897. Originally, she would carry livestock and passengers, but they figured that wouldn't be very popular or luxurious, so some last-minute changes to her cargo hold meant for livestock was converted to a third-class quarters. She was also the largest in the White Star Line fleet at the time, so she was comfortable and impressive after she entered service in February of 1898. During the early months of 1897, while Simric was still being built, Ismay and the rest of the company's officials saw that they'd need another addition to their fleet for passenger service on the Northern Atlantic, being they were beginning to lag behind competitors. And so they planned another two liners. They were to be named Oceanic, the second ship of this name, and Olympic. Hold your horses, we're getting there. It's not the Olympic we know and love. The first keel plates were laid for Oceanic in March of 1897, however there were immediate problems. A vessel this enormous had never been built, and so there wasn't proper equipment to build this ship. They had to wait until a proper overhead gantry crane could be built, though she was successfully launched on January 14, 1899, to a large crowd of over 50,000 people. Oceanic was also the last ocean liner launched in the 19th century, and everyone looked forward to the innovation in the new century. Unfortunately for Thomas Ismay, he wouldn't be able to enjoy his beloved Oceanic, the pride of his fleet. Just a few weeks after Oceanic was launched, Ismay began experiencing pains in his chest, and from there his health only worsened. He was deteriorating so rapidly that managers for both Harland and Wolf and White Star Line canceled the plans to construct Oceana's sister ship, Olympic. As we know, the name would be used 12 years later after being shelved for that amount of time. For a brief moment in time, his health would improve just enough to allow him to visit Oceanic upon her completion in Belfast in July of 1899. While visiting Belfast to see Oceanic, city officials awarded him with the key to the city. They celebrated his contributions to the local economy and to British merchant shipping. A month later in August, his health took a serious downturn once more, and he would undergo two operations in an attempt to alleviate the ailments he suffered from, but to no avail. Ismay suffered a heart attack on September 14, 1899, living in horrific and agonizing pain for 10 long, hard weeks until he passed away on November 23, 1899 at the age of 62. Immediately after his passing, Thomas Ismay's son, J. Bruce Ismay, would succeed him as chairman for the White Star Line. J. Bruce Ismay had the helm, so to speak, and was joined at Ismay Emery & Company by his friend Harold Sanderson, his brother James Ismay, the now elderly William Emery, and the already present members of Ismay, Emery & Company. Quickly, the company was swept up into the Second Boer War. For anyone unfamiliar, the Second Boer War, also known as the Anglo-Boer War, the Boer War, or the South African War, was a conflict fought between the British Empire and the two Boer Republics over the Empire's influence in Southern Africa from 1899 to 1902. White Star Line ships would be requisitioned to serve as armed merchant cruisers in this conflict, starting with the cargo ship SS Nomadic. This ship is different than the tender boat SS Nomadic that would serve the Olympic class. During the conflict, 10 White Star ships would assist in the war effort, transporting 17,000 men and 4,000 animals in just over two years. The next ships to be built for the White Star Line are known lovingly as the Big Four, and they are beloved by the ship community for various reasons. The first three sisters, the Celtic, Cedric, and Baltic, would all be the largest ships in the world individually at their respective launch dates, with each ship being larger than its predecessor. Though Adriatic was larger than her sisters, her popularity and size were dwarfed by the two Cunard sisters, Lusitania and Mauritania, stripping away Adriatic's title of largest ship on the sea before she ever got to hold it. If you'd like to hear more about RMS Lusitania, we have an episode on her. Just check the cards for this video. The big four were still successful, being enormous, comfortable, and luxurious, and their engine design would prove to be revolutionary. This is all we will be covering with the Big Four in this episode, however, if you would like a future episode on these ships or four individual episodes for them, please let me know down in the comments section. I'd love to make one. 
While each of the big four were being gradually entered into the fleet, White Star Line would simultaneously acquire smaller intermediate liners in preparation for a massive expansion on the northern Atlantic. In 1903, they acquired five new liners, starting with Arabic. In 1902, the International Mercantile Marine Company, or IMM for short, bought White Star Line. The creator of Chase Bank, J.P. Morgan, owned IMM and was attempting to monopolize the shipping trade on the Northern Atlantic by snatching up several shipping companies or entering into agreements with some, such as German Hapag, also known as the Hamburg America Line, and Norddeutsche Lloyd. The biggest fish IMM would catch was the White Star Line, setting their eyes on Cunard Line next. However, Cunard would not be acquired. To seal the deal, Morgan offered the shareholders of White Star Line 10 times the value of all profits generated in 1900. And this wasn't cheap. 1900 was an incredible year for White Star Line, and so Morgan was willing to shell out some major cash for White Star. Though initially the Ismay family resisted, knowing Thomas Ismay would be incredibly opposed to selling out his beloved company, J. Bruce Ismay would end up folding and agreeing with the other shareholders. At this time, his brother James and two of the five other directors for Ismay Emory & Company would step away. William James Perry, the director for Harlan & Wolf, would join Ismay, both becoming two of the 13 directors of IMM. Though White Star Line was very profitable and made IMM money, the massive monopoly was still experiencing massive difficulties and struggling to pay back its debts to shipyards. Clement Griscom, the aging president of IMM, just didn't think he had the energy or the efforts to get the struggling company on its feet. And so, it was proposed to Bruce Ismay in 1904 to replace him. Ismay reluctantly agreed, but only if he had J.P. Morgan's full support. And he did. After the acquisition by IMM, White Star Line would undergo rapid expansion, immediately acquiring four new liners originally operated by the Dominion Line. These liners did well, but White Star Line still had bigger goals in mind, and this is where things start to get more familiar. They were rendering an express service to New York City, departing from a brand new dock in Southampton, England. The service would leave Southampton every Wednesday, heading to the French port of Cherbourg that evening, then to Queenstown, Ireland Thursday morning, and out to New York City that afternoon. Southampton was far closer to London than Liverpool, which gave the city an edge when it came to speeding up travel times. And they created a port in Cherbourg, giving passengers an option to disembark or embark at either a British or continental port. It was revolutionary and very successful. And now, enter the Olympic class. In 1907, the express service would officially move from Liverpool to Southampton. Initially, Teutonic, Majestic, Oceanic, and Adriatic would service this express service. But these vessels, Adriatic especially, were slow despite being large and able to carry more passengers. And so White Star Line made big plans for some big ships to establish a much more efficient and regular service east and west on the Atlantic. Harland and Wolf received their orders for the Olympic class, starting with Olympic and Titanic, and White Star Line continued making power moves. They would reduce third-class fares, making them more affordable and making them a slam dunk in a price war in Southampton between them and other companies. In 1909, White Star Line would take over the Dominion Line, which was another IMM company serving the Canadian route. Two of the ships under construction then were taken over by White Star Line, being named Laurentic and Megantic. The revolutionary engine design in Laurentic would be shared with the Olympic class liners. If you'd like to hear more about that, check the cards for the link to the episode on SS Laurentic. As soon as she entered the service in June 1911, Olympic was immediately a success. And because of this massive success, a third sister ship was ordered, the RMS Britannic. As we covered yesterday in the Olympic episode, the sinking of Titanic caused upset after upset, with work strikes and hastily installed collapsible lifeboats. Olympic would be withdrawn from service in October of 1912 for improvements and re-entered the service in March of 1913. Britannic's construction was postponed to allow the lessons learned from Titanic to be implemented into the design, which we will go over at the end of the month when we cover Britannic. As we know, Britannic wouldn't see passenger service as World War I began and the White Star Line would be swept up into it. Initially, the White Star Line's fleet was a major issue, being it controlled 35 ships that all served in the war effort, 
whether they were commissioned by the Royal Navy directly or through the framework of the Liner Requisition Act. Essentially, during the war, the government had the power of not only conscription of needed soldiers, but also needed land, equipment, and other resources needed, including ocean liners, through the Liner Requisition Committee, working with the Ministry of Shipping. The express route from Southampton was halted to avoid heavy losses, and only Baltic and Adriatic were left standing on the Liverpool to New York route, joined by ships loaned by the Red Star Line. As for the other White Star ocean liners, Oceanic, Teutonic, Celtic, and Cedric were converted into auxiliary cruisers, joining the 10th Squadron of the Royal Navy. Majestic never fought, as her scrapping had started a few weeks before she could be requisitioned. The first wartime loss for White Star Line would be Thomas Ismay's dream, the Oceanic, which would be grounded and lost on September 8, 1914. The first White Star Line ship lost to enemy action would be SS Arabic, being torpedoed and sinking off the Irish coast in August of 1915, killing 44 people. In November of 1916, Britannic would strike a sea mine off the Greek island of Kea and sink, being the largest loss during the war for White Star Line and the largest ship lost during World War I. The Simric would also sink in 1916 as she was torpedoed off the coast of Ireland in May, and the cargo ship Georgic would be scuttled with all 1,200 horses being transported still on board after coming in contact with the German merchant raider SMS Mo. In 1917, Laurentic would sink after striking a mine, killing 354 people and taking 3,211 gold ingots to the bottom of the ocean with her. The next month, the Afric was sunk by a torpedo, with the Delphic being sunk by a torpedo in August and the Justicia being torpedoed and sunk shortly afterward. We do have a video on the SS Justicia if you're interested. Again, just check the cards. The company's fleet transported almost 550,000 soldiers and 4 million tons of cargo during the war, with nearly 325 officers, marshals, engineers, and medics being decorated during the war while serving on White Star Line ships. After World War I, the surviving ships retired from military service to resume their lives as commercial vessels. Because of the staggering losses during the war, especially Britannic, White Star Line was due war reparations. They acquired the Gallic and Bardic, as well as the Haverford and the Poland. They also attained three German liners that were ceded to Britain as war reparations under the terms of the Treaty of Versailles to replace Britannic, Oceanic, Arabic, Simric, and Laurentic. They were the former SS Bismarck, no, not the infamous one from World War II which was renamed Majestic, the SS Berlin renamed Arabic, and the SS Columbus renamed to Homeric. Majestic, being the largest, would become the company's flagship and served beside Olympic on the Southampton to New York City route until the Great Depression. Profits also plummeted due to the Immigration Act of 1924, as well as the Great Depression in the 1930s, and the White Star Line's profits would dwindle. After World War I, IMM was hanging by a thread, and White Star Line would be withdrawn from the failing company after tense arguments back and forth between the United States government and the British Board of Trade. During the Great Depression, the company would continue to struggle, as did all shipping companies. The man who had taken over Harlan and Wolfe after the death of Lord Perry, a man by the name of Lord Calcent, had purchased all the shares of White Star Line for £7,907,661 in November of 1926. Alas, though he wanted to save the company and his own shipping company, the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, it was destined for failure. He needed to replace an aging fleet at a time when there was significant financial hardships, mainly paying back treasury loans that were approaching maturity. In 1928, a new Oceanic would be ordered and a keel for the 1,000-foot-long vessel. But, while the construction of the keel was underway, work stopped in 1929 and it never resumed. The keel would be dismantled and the parts would go to other ships. To survive the economic crisis that was happening within the company during the Great Depression, the White Star Line limited its spending. The oldest ships were sold, with the larger ones being used for cruises. But despite building two new ships, the Britannic and the Georgic, profits were still low, and the company seemed almost bankrupt by 1933. This is when discussions began to take place to merge Cunard and White Star Line, as both were struggling financially. J. Bruce Ismay, despite having exited the company 20 years earlier, tried his best to participate in the rescue of his father's beloved company. 
He wanted to work with the approval of the government to make a new company that would operate and build ships like the Britannic and the Georgic, but it never came to fruition. Sadly, Ismay would die in 1937 without being able to save White Star Line. Aging ships would be scrapped without being replaced. Sadly, all of the big four except Adriatic would be in that grouping. Because of the Great Depression, White Star Line and Cunard Line were both on the brink of financial devastation. Work was halted on Cunard's newest ship, Hull 534, which would later be RMS Queen Mary, in 1931 to save as much money as possible. The British government agreed to provide assistance to the two competitors in 1933 under one condition. They merge into one company. The two companies agreed to the terms, and this agreement would be completed on December 30, 1933. The company would be called Cunard White Star Limited as of May 1934, Cunard having the larger 62% share opposed to White Star Line's 38% share because it had a few more ships in its fleet. Olympic would be withdrawn from service and scrapped in 1937, ending the last of the Olympic class. In 1947, Cunard bought out the last of the 38% White Star Line shares, and the company would revert to the name Cunard, ending the White Star Line. Nomadic is the only White Star Line ship to remain, as she is dry docked in Belfast, Ireland. You could technically count the Queen Mary as a White Star Liner, since she was built under Cunard White Star and is therefore 38% White Star Liner, right? I count it. Cunard still exists today, of course, and they remember White Star Line by ensuring each of their ships will provide customers with White Star service, and this is where the White Star Line story ends. There are vastly more details that weren't covered in this episode, but I hope this gives at least a basic understanding of the company that built the Titanic. Thank you for tuning in to the first bonus episode of Titanic Month on Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a 5-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and to interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Monday for another bonus episode on the history of Harland and Wolf, the shipbuilders for the White Star Line. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.